friends, how are you today? I hope you're having a lovely one wherever you are. Uh, if you're new here, hey, what's up? My name is Liz, and this is Creating Crime Time, where I'm your host, and I talk about a true crime case. So, also, if you're new, this is the 25 Days of True Crime. Yeah. Yeah. And if you don't know what that is, basically, this... 25 days of true crime I decided to do instead of doing like a vlogmas you know how people do vlogmas well I'm doing it about crime so I hope you guys enjoy and uh yeah from December 1st until December 25th you're gonna get a true crime case every single day every single day the um what was I gonna say I already lost my train of thought. So if you are interested, you want to keep watching and supporting this channel, click that red subscribe button. Don't forget to turn your bell notification on to all and hit the like button, whatever that does for analytics. I have no idea. And, um, yeah, let's, uh, let's get into today's true crime case. This is gonna, probably going to be a long one probably going to be a long one. Um, and I'm going to give you a warning beforehand. Uh, we're going to be talking about the freeway killer or the trash bag killer as he's more commonly known as. Um, his name is Patrick Kearney. So this case involves necrophilia and dismemberment and I do have some graphic details. So if you uh, don't want to hear any of that, click out. If you do, <sighs> hope you enjoy the ride. Yay! So, when I saw a picture of this dude, I was like, wow, what a geek. He's cute. Like, he's uh, not like, oh my god, I find him so attractive. No. Uh, he's cute, like, he's just like, probably that quiet dude that just is like, there. Quiet to himself. He's got the, the big, big, like, boxy glasses. And he just like... I don't know, he's cute. Maybe like, he's well put together. We'll put it like that. You know how some well put together people are like cute? Yeah, I think that's think that's what I'm trying to get at. Uh, he was born on the 24th of September, 1939 in East LA. Yay. His span of crimes are from 1962 until March 13th, 1977. <clears throat> he was the oldest of three sons. Uh, he was raised in like a very reasonably stable family. He as he was super thin and he was a sickly child and he was often the target of bullies in school. Um, in his teens, this is when he became very withdrawn and he fantasized about killing people. So he during his childhood, he would also, like, live in Texas, but his family would move back to California, um, and he would, too, after he had a very brief marriage that ended in divorce, and he would eventually go to work as an engineer at Hughes Aircraft. From, so, from his experiences in his early years in California, this is where Patrick cultivated his skill as a gay pickup artist. He was very eloquent of picking up men, we'll say that. So he mostly sought out partners in San Diego and in Tijuana, Mexico, uh, because he was fluent in Spanish and he had a keen interest in uh, Latin American culture. He liked them Spanish boys. Or should we say he liked them Latin American boys? We'll say that. That sounds more. That sounds more appropriate. Him. So, and because of his interest in Latin American American culture, this was a basis for him to connect with his potential victims and potential partners. So Patrick claimed to have killed a his first victim, which was a hitchhiker, and he claimed that he picked him up and murdered him in Orange, California around 1962. Uh, he also claimed several more victims who were transients or homeless people uh, before 
before moving to Redondo Beach, which was near LA in 1967, and this was with a younger man named David Hill, and David Hill uh, became his lover. Spicy. <laughs> so as time passed, David and Patrick would argue and argue and argue, and because of this, Patrick would go out on long solitary drives in his Volkswagen Beetle or in his truck. And on these drives is when he would pick up and kill young male hitchhikers and young men from gay bars. Uh, Patrick was considered a necrophile, which if you don't know what that means, basically a necrophile is, is somebody that, I mean, necrophilia is having sex with dead people. So, we'll just... And, um, this was generally consistent. Like, they saw markings that were consistent with the manner in which he murdered his victims and he would dispose of their remains. Uh, so, he was a super small guy. He was only 5'5 five, five in height. And he was, like, very lean. Not, like, lean muscular-wise. Like, lean, like, small petite-wise. Um, and he typically preferred men that were a lot bigger than him. A lot bigger. So, because of this, because Patrick was super small, he preferred somebody bigger. And because of this, he was forced to resort to a system of, like, subduing his victims. Um that was unlikely to fail, or he would create scenarios in which could place him in physical danger, um, and this would cause unwanted exposure to authorities. Like, he, he was not known to resort to sadism or to inflict, inflict pain on his victims, as any of the other freeway killers did. He preferred being super quick and super, like, efficient with his murders. So, Patrick would confess that he did experiment on his victims' bodies out of curiosity, uh, such as cutting one of the bodies open so he could see their stomach, um, and he would do this post-mortem so they wouldn't, he wouldn't cause any pain to them. I mean, I guess that's kind of tender-hearted, right? If you think about it. A little bit of tender-hearted? I don't know. So, Patrick confessed to having committed his first murder in the spring of 1962. This victim's name is unknown, uh, but he did confirm that this victim was 19 years of age and white. So, not like his normal likings. Um, Patrick said he convinced the man to ride on his motorcycle with him and lured him into a secluded area of Indio, California. And when he arrived, this is when Patrick shot him in the head and sexually assaulted his body. Uh, they don't know if the body was ever found, but Patrick did indeed confess to committing this murder and two additional ones in 1962. His second victim was actually the younger cousin of his first victim, and this guy, this victim, the younger cousin, saw Patrick drive away with the first victim, if that makes sense. So victim number one uh, is related to number two. Number two saw number one drive away with Patrick, and thus Patrick came back for number two and killed him. Um, the first murder that Patrick confessed to and was convicted um, of actually occurred sometime around Christmas. This was in 1968, and this was when he lived in Culver City. This was actually, like, about a year after he met David Hill and they started living together. So the murder took place at his Van Buren Avenue residence. Oh, I just, like, that sounded so fancy when I read it. I was like, ooh named after a president, you know, Martin Van Buren. So the Van Buren residence. Ooh. <sighs> According to Patrick, um, he, the victim, this victim was lured inside of his vehicle in San Diego and then he took him to his home, he shot him in the head, and this was briefly after entering the house. The victim would then be dragged to the bathroom, of which he would be sodomized. Then he would be skinned and dismembered in the bathtub with an X-Acto knife. 
so Patrick, because he didn't want to get caught, he extracted the bullet from the from that victim's head, um, basically to ensure that the murder wouldn't go back to him. <sighs> uh, he would then bury the dismembered body behind his garage. After this, he didn't kill for about a year, and this was primarily out of fear that law enforcement would inquire about that man's disappearance. So as time would pass, his MO would change, and this would enable him to carry out more crimes and enable him to make sure that they're more frequent, more frequent and efficient. So starting in 74, um, Patrick estimated to have committed murders almost monthly. Um, after picking up his victims on the freeway or in a gay bar, in his Volkswagen or his truck, he would typically shoot them in the temple right above the ear with a Derringer 22 pistol um, with his right hand while he was steering the car. That way, while they were driving, he could kill them. And it, he has his, like... This is the best way I can tell you. Like, he's driving, he's got the gun in his hand, because, you know, he's got it in the right hand, it's on the temple of his victim. So he has a good grip on the steering wheel. That way, there's no erratic driving, there's nobody that's going to pull him over, everybody thinks it's normal. So, after shooting them, he would leave the bodies, but he, like... They would be slumped upright in the passenger seat, and he would drive to a secluded area, and then then he would violate them sexually. Um, after copulating, I like that word, copulating, after copulating with his victims, this is when Patrick would mutilate them and dismember the remains and, with a hacksaw before disposing of them in various locations such as canyons and landfills along freeways. And they were typically found in industrial trash bags, hence why he's called the trash bag killer. So, in some cases, Patrick would dispose of the bodies in a desert. <clears throat> and this was basically so that the body would become consumed by the scavenger animals that were out there. Patrick would sometimes drain the blood from the victim's body and he thought this was to eliminate odor and would sometimes bathe the body prior to disposal to minimize evidence found on the body and to also minimize dried blood that could be on the body. Sometimes he also would beat them after being dead and dismembered. So he found that beating his dead victims was actually very cathartic to him um, because this was a means to express his suppressed anger from his, like, and he would get, like, a sense of power from this. Oftentimes, his victims resembled people who had bullied him in his childhood. So... Even though Patrick primarily preyed on younger men, there is one child, there, well, not like one, there is known children and young adolescent victims. So his youngest victim is five, and his name is Ronald Dean Smith, and he disappeared in Lenox, California on August 24th, 1974. His body would be discovered in Riverside County, um, this was on the 12th of October in 1974. So another child is Merle. His nickname is Hondo and his last name is Chance. He was eight and he was from Venice. He disappeared on the 6th of April of 1977 uh, while he was riding his bike in the vicinity of Patrick's place of work. Patrick claimed to have smothered the boy to, and he took him overnight where he would later dispose of the remains in Angeles National Forest um, off of the Angeles Crest Highway. And this was about 11 miles north of Altadena. Um, so Merle's decomposed remains would be found on May 26, 1977. So about a month and a half later that he would be discovered. And Merle is, his, is Patrick's last known victim. 
So on June 16th of 1976, Patrick would kill Michael Craig McGee, and he was 13 of Redondo Beach, California. Uh, records would determine that Michael had a lengthy history of juvenile delinquency. Uh, Patrick claimed to have picked up Michael, who was hitchhiking from Inglewood Avenue near Lenox, and he wanted to go to Torrance, California. According to police, Patrick befriended Michael and invited him to attend a camping trip with him to Lake Elsinore um, over the course of the weekend. Patrick claimed to have perceived Michael as a potential threat, and he shot him without any warning. And this was after... Michael was openly talking about his criminal exploits and inquired about the presence and location of burglar alarms in Patrick's house. So basically, this little boy was irritating the fuck out of him and Patrick decided to kill him. Basically, that's all it is, if you think about it. Um, later, when Patrick would be interviewed by detectives, um, he implied that he destroyed the remains and that he, I disposed of the body and you aren't going to find him. So the victim that ultimately led to Patrick's arrest was John Otis LeMay. He was 17 and he was killed on Sunday, March 13th of 1977. And this happened approximately at 5.30 p.m. on the same day. So John told a neighbor he was going to Redondo Beach. And he told them that he was going to see a man named Dave who he met at a local gym. Uh, this was in fact actually David Hill, who is Patrick's lover. Um, and David gave LeMay the address of, like, to their house. Hill was absent when John arrived, and because of this, Patrick was home. Patrick then invited John to watch TV with him until David returned. So, without any, without being provoked, Patrick impulsively reached for his, his pistol and he shot John in the back of the head. Patrick would later dismember his corpse and dump his remains in the desert. Yeah. Yeah. So, when... His killing spree was at its peak. Patrick's odd tendencies went largely undetected. A local grocery store owner, and his name is Jerry Stevens, did however note that Patrick frequently bought butcher knives after examining them, inquiring about the quality of the steel. And this same man also described Patrick as a loner with an eerie sense of quiet about him. So... Patrick's supervisor at Hughes Aircraft referred to him as a model worker. Like there wasn't anything out of the blue. Yeah. Yeah. It's always the normal ones. So, there's 25 different victims. <sighs> yeah. And I have an entire list of them that I can read to you guys. Hopefully I don't say them wrong. Um, Alright, so victim number one, which would be John Doe number one. Um, this was the spring of 1962. Uh, he was driven to a deserted area, shot in the head, and sodomized post-mortem. John Doe number two, again, 1962. He was 16. John Doe number one was 19, if I didn't say age. Um, driven to the same location as the first victim, shot in the head and sodomized. Yeah. Um, number three is Mike. Shot in the back of the head and sodomized post-mortem. He was 18. Uh, they don't know when he was murdered and there is no discovery of him. Which is the same of John Doe 1 and John Doe 2. Um, victim number four is a, is George who uh, was shot in the head while sleeping and then put in the bathtub and sodomized post-mortem. Uh, police found his skeleton after Patrick directed them 
to him. Uh, he died in 1968, but we be discovered in 77. Yeah. John Demichik is next. He was 13. Um, he died on June 26, 1971. He would be discovered in 73, and he was shot to death. Yay. All right. <clears throat> James Fletcher Barwick, 17. Um, 22nd of September 1973 is when he was murdered and he would be found the same day he was shot in the back of the head. Ronald Dean Smith Jr., 5. 24th of August 1974. Would be found in October 1974 and he was suffocated. Albert Rivera was 21. Uh, he died on the 13th of April of 1975. Uh, would be found the same day. He was shot in the head. He was taken to Patrick's house, sodomized post-mortem, dismembered, stuffed in trash bags, uh, to be disposed in various locations. <clears throat> Larry Jean Walters was born, was murdered on the 31st of October of 1975. He was 20 years old. Um, he would be discovered on the 10th of November of 1975. So... Ten days later, he would be found. He was shot, sodomized, post-mortem and dismembered, put in trash bags, and disposed of in various locations. <sighs> Kenneth Eugene Buchanan, he was 17. He died on the 1st of March, 1976, because of a shot, a shot in the back of the head and sodomized, then shot three more times. He was discovered about a month and six days later, on April 7th of 1976. <clears throat> Oliver Peter Molitor, uh, 13, he died the 21st of March of 1976. He has never been found. Um, he was picked up while hitchhiking, sexually assaulted, shot and dismembered, buried in various areas um, at the Palace, Palace Verdes landfill. Um, this was a fact given by Patrick. Ooh, Larry Armadures, um, he was 15, he died on the 18th of April of 1976, and he was found the next day, shot in the back of the head, sodomized, post-mortem, and dismembered. So a lot of these guys were sodomized and dismembered post-mortem. I think I'm going to stop saying that part, and if there's anything different, I'm just going to add it into it. Uh, yeah, so Michael McGee, who we discussed... His body has never been found. He died on the 11th of June, 1976. John Woods, uh, 23. Let me fix myself. <laughs> yeah. So, owie, owie. Yeah, John Woods, um, he was 23. He was murdered on the 20th of June, 1976. <sighs> yeah, he was found the next day. He was shot to death. Larry Epps. SB 17 he died in 1976 and he would be found like there's no definitive date of when he was killed he would be found on August 23rd of 1976 yeah Wilfred Lawrence Faraday or Faher Faherty Faherty Wilfred uh, was 20. He died in August of 1976, and there's no definitive day, but he would be found on the 28th of August in 1976, and he was shot in the back of the head. So there are some victims where they were not sodomized, and some were. Yeah. <clears throat> Randall Lawrence Moore, 16. Again, died in August of 1976. He was discovered on the 10th of October of 1976. He was just shot in the head. Timothy Brian Ingram, he was 19. He died on the 15th of September of 1976. And he would be found on the 24th of September of 1976. Um, he was shot in the back of the head while he was asleep. And his remains were just thrown into a ravine. Robert Benefiel, he was 17. Uh, he died in the fall of 1976, and he was discovered in the fall of 1976. Yeah. He was a hitchhiker. He was picked up while hitchhiking. He would be d dumped in various locations. 
Uh, David Allen. He was 27. He died in the fall of 1976. He would be found on October 9th of 1976. And he was found on the side of the road because he was just shot in the head. Mark Andrew Orit. Orich or Orock. Mark Mark Andrew Orock. Um, he was 20 and he died on the 5th of October 1976 and he was discovered the next day. He was just shot in the head. Uh, Nicholas Hernandez Jimenez, he was 28, died January 1977, was found on the 23rd of that month. His body was wrapped in trash bags for disposal. Arturo Ramo, oh my goodness, Arturo Ramos Marquez, or Marquez. Um, he, let's try that again. Hold on. Arturo Ramos Marquez. Uh, he was 24, and he died on the 26th of February of 1977, and he was discovered on the 3rd of March that year. Uh, John Otis LeMay, his, he, he died on the 13th of March in 1977. He was 17, and he was discovered five days later on the 18th of March. Now, this is the crime in which Patrick would be arrested for. And then his last victim, which is Merle Hondo Chance, he was eight, and he died on the 6th of April of 1977, and he would be discovered on the 26th. He was dumped off of Angeles Crest Highway. If you have been listening since the beginning of this case, you would have already heard that. So, eventually Patrick gets arrested. So, John LeMay's remains were found on the 18th of March of 1977. Police had actually been to Patrick's house for the investigation for John's, like, for the investigation into John LeMay. And this was prior to uh, Merle Chance's kidnapping and murder. Police would soon discover uh, John had been seen in the company of Patrick and David. So eventually, Patrick and David would flee California. And they would end up going to El Paso, Texas. And Patrick resigned from his job. No, me and my honey, we're just going to go to El Paso. Bye. Yeah, so the their families persuaded them to turn themselves in. And David, who was 36 at the time, he was eventually cleared of any involvement in any of the crimes, and he would be released. Patrick, on the other hand, he would make a full confession, initially admitting to a total of 28 murders, um, but subsequently he would confessed to his involvement in about seven more. Um, in order to avoid the death penalty, he agreed to plead guilty, and he would be charged with 21 counts of murder. And as agreed, he pled guilty. Um, he was given 21 consecutive life sentences without the possibility of parole. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, police were certain that Patrick was responsible for the murders of seven other men that he he had admitted to, but due to lack of lack of physical evidence, they couldn't charge him. Um, and he currently, since 2014, is at the California State Prison in Mule Creek, um, and this is known as of October 2014. <sighs> yeah, so that's the lovely case of the trash bag killer known as Patrick Kearney. That was a lot. That's a lot of, um, I think that's the highest victim count that we have talked about so far on this channel. Um, there's another case in particular that I think I'm going to cover, but I'm not sure. So I hope you guys enjoyed today's video. If you did, hit that like button. Don't forget to subscri subscribe by hitting that red button wherever the hell it is down there. Uh, during, turn your bell notification all onto all. That way you know whenever I upload. Yeah, and I just, I'm excited to see what path this channel takes. Um, also, if there's any case you want me to cover, don't forget to put those in the comments down below. That way I know and I have time to research them so I can put a video up for you guys. So I hope you guys enjoyed and I'll see you guys tomorrow for another true crime case for the 25 Days of True Crime. Bye!